they send you a bunch of CDs that you had to listen or watch at that time. <laughs> instead wow. of wa- CDs. <laughs> <laughs> Just dated yourself, man. <laughs> Yeah, I know, yeah. It was <laughs> they weren't. They, I don't. Even, I don't even think. Maybe they were DVDs. I don't. Sure, they weren't like the black floppy. It was probably VCR. I don't know. <laughs> Betamax. <laughs> VCR. You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome to another episode of the Barbell Logic podcast. Today, I am taking over the host role. This is Andrew Jackson, Vice President of Operations at Barbell Logic, and I'm joined today by CJ Gocher. Ahoy. And Becca Krieg. Yeah. <laughs> CJ is our Academy Director, and Becca is our Curriculum Developer at Barbell Logic. The three of us have been working together for about a year now. Yes. Has it been that long? Yeah. Time flies. I mean, it feels like five, but maybe that's just COVID. <laughs> right. A year in 2020 is a different time metric. <laughs> right. Yeah. So we've been working together for last year on our academy curriculum. That's been a lot of fun revisiting the curriculum after running it for two years and kind of taking all of our lessons learned and applying those to earlier this year, releasing a new curriculum. And now we're about to launch a new iteration of that curriculum, again, based on lessons learned and some new problems that we've seen that we want to help solve. But before we get into that, really what I wanted to talk to you guys about, because we've had this conversation a couple of different times throughout the year, is really about being an adult learner more than anything and how in a lot of ways, I think we've been drawn to this community at Barbell Logic in particular because of being, generally speaking, curious people that are always looking for a way to level up our game. And in particular, seeking knowledge and continuing to learn even as we've moved beyond different formal education paths and into kind of our professional worlds, we still are all people that continue to seek knowledge. So that's what I was thinking we could talk about today. And I'm curious, before we you know, dive into that even, I'm curious what your guys' background has been with education and kind of how that's evolved over your life, your early years, and into being a professional. Well, uh, I probably have a more cynical take on it than, <laughs> uh, than Becca. Do you want to go first? Oh, okay. All right. Me? Sure. I can go first. I am a daughter of two teachers. So mm, as am I, I would say my whole life has been education. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. In fact, my parents thought I would become a teacher mm-hmm. and I was kind of resistant to that, you know, like growing up, mm-hmm. I wanted to study biology. So I do have a, a bachelor of science in biology and anatomy concentration. But when I was kind of deciding what to do next, I took one of those tests, you know, to say like, what should be good at? And like, teacher, teacher popped up coaching actually popped up too, Mm. which was interesting Mm. and also physical therapy. And so at that time it was a definite growing field. And I was certainly interested in getting something I could get hired for pretty easily. So I ended up because of a relationship and getting married, doing a PTA program instead of graduate school, which in the end ended up being a very good thing for me, financially speaking, because I was much more flexible once I got out and started working in the field of physical therapy, not to have student loans to pay back. Mm. So I guess <laughs> my whole thing is I really value, I thought my education in college was like, great, like the hard science degree, you know, kind of learning how to learn science and study science. And I definitely am a proponent of higher education in general, though I fully understand the pros and cons having one son in college and one about to go to college or two in the middle of this COVID pandemic. It's a little bit of a unique experience. And my husband has been someone who currently Caleb Creek, who's also a black coach has been someone of like, should I finish my degree or not? Like started off with a hard science degree, but really was into coaching and what's the best investment of time kind of situation. So I'm very sympathetic to higher education in general. I, I had a very positive experience 
was blessed to have like academic scholarship and athletic scholarship. So it didn't cost me very much. So I understand in that sense, I was like lucky, Mm -hmm. but then the decision to go on to graduate school was presented before me. And I wanted to start a family young and all that sort of thing. So at that point it was a little bit like I can do this, this associate's degree and get working and get into the field and get that sort of hands-on experience that I was craving. I wanted to work with people with patients. And so that's what I did. It actually was like, a community college program. So I did like a reverse, like I did a full bachelor's degree and then went back to community college for associate's degree. But it's a very tough program actually to become a PTA. It's not like an easy associate's degree by any means. It's pretty rigorous. And then I did really well in that past that, of course, got my license, started working with patients and really loved it. And being a therapist is not unlike being a coach for sure in the aspects of learning how to deal with people and how to push people to do things they don't want to do. So in that regard, I sort of was already coaching. And I actually also was coaching high school basketball, which I did for eight years. So that was also an education Mm -hmm. (laughs) in uh, dealing with people. So for me, like I've always been curious person, always wanted to learn more things. I've loved the blend of academic knowledge and the hands-on experience of actually like, right interacting with people and doing the thing. Right. Um, so I started pursuing strength. I mean, I've always been interested in exercise. Obviously I was an athlete, soccer player, coached basketball, always interested in training people and always curious about the best way to do that. Like I ran the conditioning program for our high school basketball program, which was very competitive state playoff level every year, lots of division one athletes I coached, you know, Mm-hmm. But of course, I started really learning about barbell training, like a better way to do it once I started training myself. And so that got me interested mm-hmm. in that and knowing the impact that it can have and, and even the shortfalls of physical therapy, right? Like the fact that I think physical therapists are trained with a lot of good information, especially about disease pathology and biomechanics and things like that. But they know the answer to a lot of these biological problems and illnesses and injuries is strength. But what they don't learn about is like how to actually get somebody strong. Right. Like they don't spend a lot of time in that part of the curriculum basically, which is a shame because that's like the most practical application. And so that's what actually spurred me on. I was working in physical therapy. I'm like, I need more to know about this. And my, and I actually injured my shoulder. My orthopedist said, I want you to get your shoulder stronger and not just what you know how to do. I want you to increase the muscle mass on your shoulder Mm -hmm. because I had a very hypermobile shoulder. And so like I started with CrossFit because I thought that was a good way to learn how to get strong. Right. Yeah. But then I started, you know, educating myself about barbell training. And so from that point on, like, I've just always been curious on how to do something better. Right. Like not tie in what, you know, academically to the practical part of like right. actually helping someone make a difference in their life. And so that's where I've come from as my background to this point. And certainly when the opportunity came about to like teach a barbell class for the Barbell Academy, I was like, yes, because I'm interested in how that works. How do you help someone help someone else use barbells, you know, to really change somebody's life? So I think I've taught like six cohort classes, maybe mm-hmm. something like that. So I've been teaching it from the beginning and I've really enjoyed every minute have like our students are awesome that we get in the academy. Like, I don't know. And then when we started thinking about rewriting their curriculum, of course, it was kind of like a natural passion for me to like think about and try to, you know, make it better. So that's kind of my background. Yeah, it's interesting. There's a lot of similarities where the kind of early academic learning was very structured and classroom based. And then within the fields that you were pursuing, there were some practical hands-on mentorship type programs. Right. And then when it came to actually getting stronger as a pursuit that you wanted to learn about, it sounded like to me, and very similar to my experience, there wasn't really anything structured. It wasn't like you said, well, I'm going to go to the Get Stronger class. Right. Absolutely. And then I'm going to <laughs> go mentor under this Get Stronger person and have this really kind of smooth transition into that, it was this process of cobbling together and kind of trying to figure out how to do it, cobbling together different resources. Right. And exactly. And I think I saw that for my patients too. Like, right. Like, so mm. uh, somebody has surgery, 
you kind of help them along in the beginning month or so in process, Mm -hmm. but you know, they're sort of like not yet where they need to be. But of course, insurance money runs out and they, you know, stop coming to therapy. And I was like, there's something else after that. Right. So, Mm -hmm. right. But you only learn about, you know, that part in, and now that's changing a little bit. I think the field of PT is getting a little bit more with the program as far as understanding that strength can really make a big difference. But, and certainly there are amazing PTs out there that already are practicing with that mindset, Mm -hmm. but yeah. And CJ, how about yourself? Similar? Pretty much on the opposite side of things. (laughs) different yeah okay let's hear the other side that's why we're a good team (laughs) i actually like loved hearing that because the different you know layers of possible education between you know going back for your pta and all that that sounds cool like there was a path there uh for me i did a bunch of hobbies you know like when i was in high school middle school gymnastics fencing choir whatever the heck and as soon as i was good enough at the thing to help somebody else do the thing who's new You know, I was the junior, they were the freshman, whatever it could be. Like, that was really satisfying, you know, to me. Mm -hmm. And I was surrounded. I was at school, so there were teachers. And so it was really easy if I didn't have something to say, you know, go to them. (laughs) Like, stiff arm, default. Mm -hmm. And then I went to the Naval Academy. So I thought I was going to be an English teacher. (laughs) My my original plan, (laughs) because... Out of the Naval Academy? No, not immediately. My original plan is that I was going to do... I was either going to become a Navy SEAL and then probably do a whole career in the Navy, or I was going to end up, you know, something else, Mm -hmm. do my time and then become an English teacher. Like those were my two thoughts, right? Because that's how things go. Mm -hmm. And (laughs) educationally, I have a bachelor's of science in English or a BS in BS as I call it. (laughs) And I realized really quickly when I got to the fleet that despite four years of training and, you know, this is a considered a higher end institution, I guess, you know, respected school. Mm -hmm. We may have come in with like a three month head start Mm. on our experience and our knowledge, you know, from all those resources poured into us. And we would take on some, a little bit of a, I'm not going to say a tutoring role because we're all beginners, Mm -hmm. but we would start leading studying groups and leading, you know, all of us trying to get our qualifications. Mm -hmm. The SWO community, so surface warfare officer, we drive ships, you know, toot toot. And our job, when I walked in, my very first thing my chief told me, so I was assigned like, you know, a a senior enlisted who'd been in for over 20 years. And I asked him, so let's be straight. What's my job? And he said, figure things out. The entire experience was one where there's virtually no curriculum. There's no, there's no set path. There's just figure things out. Mm. Like there are rules, find the rule books and there, mm. are, there are uh, procedures, find the people who know the procedures and ask. Mm-hmm. And I kind of loved it. Like compared to going to classes and, right. and, you know, picking out topics, I loved being on the bridge and learning things and working with people mm-hmm. and hosting study groups and like learning from different simulators, different educational programs, like which ones, oh, that was miserable. Uh, or like, oh, wow, I learned so much from this four hour experience. Like, how could we bring that back to the ship? Mm-hmm. I got that exposure from two ships, got to see how a SEAL team operated a little bit, you know, from the staff perspective, which is obviously not the perspective of an operator who has gone through that schooling, but got to see a whole bunch of different ways of how people communicate and train in like on the job training. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. Navy is very on the job training based. (laughs) That's kind of all we have time for. I mean, they have the classroom settings and they have, um, you know, certifications and different processes you go through, obviously, that are very formal. But the primary way of learning is go do the thing with somebody else who knows how to do the thing. Stand next to that guy or gal while they're doing it. And then you sign off that you've seen it. And then eventually they let you try to do it also. (laughs) Yeah, it was really the Navy that taught me parallel learning. The mm-hmm. idea of there's a curriculum, there's a book, there's a guidance, there's procedures, there's processes, mm-hmm. and then there's doing the thing. And either one alone is just flailing. Right. Like one, you feel really good. Like I know all the knowledge. You hit the bridge the first time and you are mm-hmm. you are lost. Mm-hmm. Vice versa, you just go to the bridge and you have no idea what any of the procedures are. Then you feel kind of like you're guessing your way through. You don't learn anything from that five hours because you're just panicking the whole time, trying not to crash the ship. Right. (laughs) And so kind of taking that, 
I thought to myself, okay, I want to start coaching immediately. I wanted to get, you know, like I want to do this barbell thing now. I want to do the strength training. So not an English teacher anymore, but how can I start this education now? Mm -hmm. And I found a CrossFit gym where they were doing three days a week was a strength bias day. And I got every day, hundreds of people cycling through to work on barbell lifts. It's, it was an incredible, like just high density experience for seeing people, which was awesome. Mm -hmm. That is awesome. And I started feeling that, like that constriction of all practice and no learning, you know, no procedure, no system gotcha. to fit into it. Right. I start feeling that flail. Mm -hmm. So I went in to go further education. I had, you know, a little bit of GI Bill. So my thought was, I'm going to do this academically. But trying to go through the various local schools, the formal path, it was pretty much felt like it was designed for people at the bottom of the funnel, the four-year student. Mm -hmm. So they were like, well, you have a BS and you have most of the, you know, prereqs, but not all of them. So now you, if you're going to take our classes because we prioritize our four years, it's going to take you two years to be ready for a master's program. And it's going to be like one class a semester. And this was going to be like an exercise science degree or a, what formal path were you pursuing? Kinesiology. kinesiology. So I was looking for yeah. a master's degree in kinesiology. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a decent program at a college nearby, mm -hmm. but... <laughs> GI Bill is time-based. Mm -hmm. I was going to run out of time mm -hmm. before I finished the prereqs to get into a master's degree. And you needed a, a sponsor, essentially a professor whose work you were interested in and that kind of thing. It was such a mess right? that I was like, how else am I going to do this? So I ended up self-creating a uh, curriculum in, in a way. Mm-hmm pulling from different textbooks, finding mentors where I could, mm -hmm. going to seminars, going to workshops, trying to incorporate it. And like, okay, I learned this over a weekend, practice, 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 right. you know, learn this from a book, practice, practice, and did the best I could with it. You know, it was, right. it was what it is. It wasn't, you know, ideal. You know, I wish there had been something like I could just, you know, plug into. That's fascinating. But I ended up doing that until through the time I picked up with Barbell Logic was still doing CrossFit, so in-person and online training for several years. Then the coaching academy came up and, you know, mind blown. Right. This is awesome. Right. Like, this is everything that I love about the coaching, the teaching, the sharing of knowledge part, along with the actual barbell strength coaching. I get to do both at the same time. Right. Ultra win. Yeah. I have a question for you guys, because mm -hmm. this is interesting to me. So when we talk about, like, how you learn something, which obviously like we, CJ and I have different, had different paths to this, you guys being in the Navy and learning alongside someone who's doing, mm -hmm. do you feel like, like, what are the pros and cons of that? did you feel like you learned more what not to do or what to do? <laughs> uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, I'm just curious, like, like you've learned, you guys both were in the Navy. So, mm -hmm. you know, what was the benefit and the the downside of that sort of model of learning. That's interesting to me. I found it to be an accelerator of learning that being able to see how different people did their job because the Navy would very intentionally rotate who you were partnered with for different periods of time. So you would get to see how, you know, one officer ran the bridge or one officer for me ran the reactor room for nuclear power. And you could sort of cobble together a hybrid approach of things that you liked and things that you didn't. Okay. Surprisingly, within the confines and the structure of all the procedures you would imagine for running a warship, there's a lot of difference in how people would manage their area of responsibility or how they would mm -hmm. do things. I mean, obviously, some things had to be very by the book, but other little particular details were very different. And what I found interesting is that I think it accelerated the process of building a vision or a model of who I wanted to be in that role. And at the same time, it is a totally different experience going from doing the job with somebody that's qualified standing next to you to the point where you're in the seat, as they called it. You're like the man. When you're in the chair <laughs> or when you're standing to watch, it's a totally different game. And there's a different kind of uh, weight to it. And, and the same thing is true with barbell coaching, you know, if you've ever had the experience of coaching with a mentor nearby and then being on your own, it's very different. But the accelerated process of learning, I think, was very noticeable learning in that environment. 
Interesting. Like on top of everything you just said, because I do feel like it was, you know, accelerated. It was kind of the the rocket, you know, the Acme rocket on your back. Just accelerate your life. That was the Navy tagline. (laughs) Accelerate your, oh God. (laughs) I forgot about that one. I saw those commercials. (laughs) But it also, it was really anxiety inducing. Mm, Um, Have somebody over your shoulder. What's that? To have somebody like sitting over your shoulder or what? Partially the sitting over the shoulder thing and partially... Especially, for instance, for people who don't know, like in the Navy, you don't have one job. You usually have a primary job and you have like four mm-hmm. or five collateral duties, for right. instance. So I, I remember I was assigned to burials at sea. Mm-hmm. So I was responsible for coordinating the ceremony of burials at sea, which have a lot of separate components and coordinating between departments of the ship and that kind of thing. At one point, literally the assignment came in. I was assigned to handle this. Nobody else in the ship had run one. So they were just like, the chaplain might be able to help. Here's the, you know, handed me a procedure book. Good luck. Right. Like, don't screw it up. <laughs> yeah. Experience. And there is definitely this feeling of a whole range from running the bridge where, you know, you had that mentorship and you had those processes and you got your, you know, certification. So you had the permission to be on the bridge and you right. had that authority. And you had these experiences where like people talk about imposter, you know, the imposter uh, syndrome. Uh, mm-hmm. scenario, mm-hmm. the imposter syndrome. And geez, like every day it felt like you're facing a scenario or facing a situation nobody's prepped you for. Right. And yet you're still responsible for it. Right. For sure. And I still feel that in the gym sometimes, especially there in the beginning. But even now when there's no rule book for this, there's just, you're kind of responsible. You and the client are mostly the client because they are, you know, autonomous and have that control. But you two are both trying to navigate through this problem that there's no answer for. Right. It's interesting, the parallels. And I think it's really been a powerful experience for all of us uh, being in the academy and having those different kind of educational backgrounds and then coming to Barbell Logic, where, you know, one of the things that I've really appreciated and valued about what Matt's done with the company is as a strategic priority, teaching has been one of his top strategic priorities since the beginning of the company and investing in things like the academy and supporting the investment of our time and energy into building this curriculum and building this learning community that are pulling from all those different experiences. And it's cool to see how we've evolved as a company and as a community of coaches, as we've continued to learn, not just from our experience coaching people online and in person, but also the experience from teaching. And that has been something that I think really helped, I think, take my learning to another level and something that I've always pursued, kind of like you talked about CJ, that as soon as you became the one that didn't feel totally lost and there was maybe somebody around who was a little bit more lost than you, that you would kind of take on that (laughs) teacher role because, you know, that classic saying that when one teaches to learn has certainly been my experience. And so it's going to be interesting to see where things are going and we're kind of evolving now. I mean, Speaking of the academy and kind of what we've been working on for the last year, we've seen some of the problems with the current structure of things and are starting to evolve a little bit of how we get that learning and that teaching out to the community. What are some things that that you guys have noticed in the last year or two problems or things that we're trying to kind of adjust to for adult learners or the adult learners that are coming to Barbell Logic to be part of the academy? In my very first class, I had a student in Scotland who signed up for the course because there wasn't anything out there like Mm -hmm. it, right? Like there's nothing out there like it. He had a gym in his garage. He was coaching a few people, wanted to get better himself, wanted to help others. And he signed up for the course, like as soon as it was kind of open, because he knew like, I know these people know how to use barbells for everyday people. And I want to learn how to do that. I want to get better as a coach. But the course was at 3 a.m. his time. Right. And so, and he was a busy dad, like two young kids worked all day and he would try to stay up on Sunday night. Like I remember the first few classes, he was up with coffee, like trying to pay attention and just sleepy, but it was just hard. Like you can't, you know, get up in the middle of the night. Right. It was only once a week, but still it was a lot. And so while he continued to follow along the curriculum and still sent me assignments, like he wasn't able to attend the call. And so 
when we started first with the master's mm-hmm. anatomy class about having sort of a self-paced um, curriculum, I immediately thought of Wayne, <laughs> shout out to Wayne. Yeah. Attending. And there were others too, I know, from other classes of people to attended class at like a crazy hour for their time. Yeah, I have about one per group. Yeah. Out of the five or six that are doing it at one, two, or three in the morning. It's yeah. impressive. Well, and that was the same thing when we started advertising the anatomy class, because the first one we offered mm-hmm. was like a cohort group, right? Where you sign up and we had calls. I got so many messages of like, oh, I wish I could, but that's a horrible time for me. Like, I really want to learn this stuff. And so, like, because the sources are out there are limited for, you know, really learning how to coach barbells, you know, people were interested, but there was this time and space limitation for them. And so that's when we had the idea of starting to make it like online self-paced because then people can work on it at their own time. Cause let's face it, people in our culture at Barbell Logic, people, our clients, our coaches, the people who listen to this podcast probably <laughs> are all very, very right. busy because they are curious people. They have jobs, they're families, they're pursuing life to the fullest. Like it's trying to keep learning that one of the hardest parts about it is, you know, having something that's accessible, mm-hmm. quick and fits into your life. And so I'm excited about that aspect of kind of where we're headed as an academy to offer more opportunities for people to learn at their own pace. Because I know there's a lot of people who are curious about learning more about their own training, about how to help their mom, their sister, their neighbor. And they just, you know, don't have the time to attend a class once a week, you know, right, right, in the middle of the night, (laughs) if you're on a different continent, you know. And I know, CJ, you've spent a lot of time thinking about who it is that we're even speaking to with the curriculum. What have you seen evolve as we've gotten more students and more feedback? It's a funny thing because the six month program Mm -hmm. has been an advantage and a disadvantage for us. So like as an advantage, you get to know people really closely and Mm -hmm. really well. Yeah. And we've seen uh, it's go through this course and and submit their feedback and through mid course calls and end of course, and talking to people in these, in the weekly webinars and two things like kind of strike me, I guess the first that who is interested shifts. Mm -hmm. I always thought that, you know, cause I've done five of these now. So I kind of thought people would sign up for this because they're like me. Their, you know, strength training is their life. It's at least it's their career or their possible career. And they're looking for that grounded, full, you know, education. Like they're looking for a professional path, Mm -hmm. like a lawyer or an engineer would have or something like Mm -hmm. that. That was kind of my assumption. And I was totally wrong. Mm. Like not just, you know, meeting people and realizing the spectrum that was coming to take the class, Mm -hmm. uh, but then how their interests change over the course of a six-month class. Right, right. Yeah, yeah like, they evolve. Mm, that's true. Designing a class for coaches and for people who know they want to be a coach, they're looking to prepare for a certification. It's like, I have a niche specialty in barbells. Mm-hmm. <laughs> hey, most of the people we're teaching didn't fit in that niche to begin with. And then after six months... They're like, hey, I've got three clients who are excited to work with me. They're they're right. local people in the neighborhood, blah, blah, blah. Two of them are, I mean, they're 60 plus. Two of them can't do squats. Right. They don't have the shoulders that can handle squats right now. What do I do? What do I do? Yeah. And it's like, you, we, you design a course, you know, but realizing it's got to be flexible enough for all of that to capture all of that. And we can go in with the assumption that somebody was going to come in to be me. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been interesting. And after five courses, there's virtually no one coming through to be me or, you know, like everyone takes their own approach. Yeah. You know, we've had classes ranging from six to I think 14 people. And I'd say on average, there's one or two that are either currently professional or right on the verge of becoming some sort of a professional coach. They have a Mm -hmm. gym or they're their coaching as a near full-time occupation, usually one or two that have just started lifting, <laughs> you know, and they just really want to learn as much as they can and geek out on stuff. And the vast majority are kind of what you were describing, where they're doing this for a while, they're interested in doing a little bit more, people are starting to ask them questions and, you know, they might be coaching their friends or their neighbors and they're, you know, kind of starting to just experiment with what it's like to help somebody else and that going through that experience of getting out of what it's like to evaluate your own lifts 
when you can feel everything that's happening in your body and trying to figure out your errors and your mistakes to trying to get into somebody else's head and say things and help them or, you know, to give them a solution to fix somebody else's problem. That's a very different mental exercise. And so I think it's been eye opening to see that shift. And I definitely think it was a little bit more geared towards people looking to become certified early on. And that was really the, I think the initial intent of the coaching academy. And as we've been doing it longer, it's more towards that broader population of adult learners, kind of like what we've been talking about on this call so far is that group of people that are interested in learning as much as they can about the thing that they're interested in. And as more of a part of an evolution rather than some end fixed goal of getting a certification, that's, you know, that doesn't mean it can't be part of that path, but it's not necessarily like I'm just trying to get from point A to point B. That's interesting. I think that's true. And I agree with you guys. Like, I think a lot of our students are passionate about barbells and what they do for themselves or for their loved ones. But it kind of how we started this conversation, I definitely, and my last class in particular was full of budding coaches or people who were looking to Mm -hmm. coach, maybe pursuing the professional barbell coach certification type of thing. Like Mm -hmm. they wanted to do it for a living. And I would say that those students found in the program, and I think they would agree that nice balance of, Hey, I'm out there coaching and I'm getting this academic organized preparation at the same time. And for them, I think, you know, they would even say that, that it was like a big, like, whoosh, as we always say, we're going to have a whooshing session. It was like (laughs) all this stuff flowed together and the amount of growth that happened in that six months. Cause I think everybody grows no matter who the student is. Like you can see a transformation when we've gone through these cohorts. But I think the student who's like literally getting the like practice, the experience, the one and getting that knowledge at the same time, like, whoa, Do they really go places? Because they kind of have that nice sweet spot of both of those things. Right. Which we all three kind of talked about that, like in our own experience, learning and becoming a coach, like there is the benefit of both. But I think this we do have students like that, that are like, I'm literally, you know, coaching 10 people a week, 20 people a week. Right. And I'm also getting this like concrete way to think about what I'm doing and evaluate what I'm doing and improve the way I do it. And when those two things kind of happen at the same time, man, do those coaches take off? Like, I think it's pretty cool to watch. Yeah. I mean, I think about what we offer with the curriculum and both as a lifter and a coach, I wish this was available (laughs) 10 years ago (laughs) because there have been so many things that I did that I think with this material could have avoided. (laughs) Um, I hate to interrupt. (laughs) I hate to interrupt. There's a, I can't remember. I can't remember the book where, uh, but where the, the author essentially describes the idea that you're always going to make a mistake. You're always going to be wrong. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're always going to make a choice. Whatever choice you make, there's going to be consequences. Sure. And so there have been like, oftentimes we come through this course or we go to a coach because so many, like Andrew, you pointed out that the parallels between your coaching and your teaching or you're being a lifter and being a student, they're really close. Mm-hmm. And I see the same kind of thing here where we kind of come in with the expectation, oh, we're going to learn this thing so we don't make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And what we're coming through with the academy, what we're learning with our students, we make better mistakes. Right. Yes, that's a good way of putting it. (laughs) Going through the academy or a curriculum. I'm definitely not saying I wouldn't have made mistakes, but uh, (laughs) I think I would make better mistakes. I think I would have made more educated mistakes Mm. might be a better way of putting it. And and that's why they they would be better. I think you're also equipped to grow from the mistake more too. Mm. I don't know if you, like, you know, if you, I think back to some of the mistakes I made with coaching, like when I first started and I didn't even know they were mistakes or, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, but you're able to more, you're so more self-aware, you're more able to recognize you have something else to compare to. And so therefore your growth from the mistake is like bigger. I think. Yeah. I mean, well, and that goes straight to the heart of where we've been headed as a academy and, and, and even as Barbell Logic talking about being client centered, model informed and focused on a quality of life, mm-hmm. sort of a prioritization that 
having those models established is what I think enables that growth. Because when you do have a mistake, it fits within a paradigm that you can evaluate and, and adjust rather than it just being this kind of abstract thing that happens to you and that you're reacting to, you can interpret it. You have a means for understanding what happened and going back to the drawing board and choosing a different path consciously instead of just being like, ah, this thing's happening and I, I'm going to try this other thing and I'm going to try this other thing. Very similar to the solution that MED and Minimum Effectors of Programming provides for a programming standpoint, instead of just jumping from template to template, there's a model then to make a choice to do whatever the next small change is that you're going to do. I think that that's true for these principles that we want to instill or that we want to cover in this new curriculum is to arm coaches, arm lifters, arm curious people that just want to learn about barbell training with models and knowledge so that they can make better mistakes. I think that's a good way of putting it. Right. And I think too, like one of the benefits, I mean, online learning has its pros and cons. And I think probably everyone in the year 2020 has a perspective on that, right? Because <laughs> yeah. your, your elementary students have been, yeah. you know, cyber schooled or whatever. But for the adult learner, I think because adults have more experience, right? Like we all have this varied experience, whether it's us as a lifter, us as a person. And even I talked about this with a lot of my students, like when you come into the Barbell Academy classes, even the cohorts, mm -hmm. your life experience up to this point has already equipped you to, to deal with people on some level, mm -hmm. right? Like depending on your job or what you did, like your life experience is valuable. It's not like you're starting from ground zero. And so I think the benefit of the online format is like, and this is in contrast to the old seminar format, right? Like, which right. is, I think how us three probably started learning about barbells. That was kind of the only way you could read a book mm -hmm. or you could go to a seminar mm -hmm. and get this like information dump on you and then try to remember some of it. And like CJ said, then go home and try to practice, 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 like yeah. the one or two things you remember from the, you know, 48 hours straight of instruction. Mm -hmm. One of the benefits of the online format too is like that information is there for you to reuse and repeat. Right. And so when you go and practice and, you know, make a mistake and you go back to the curriculum and you look at it again, you know, even if it takes you 15 minutes, 20 minutes, like that is making a more permanent learning event, right? Than like going to a seminar and remembering like 10% of what is said and then trying to go back and like, you know, apply it. And I think it just fits into life better as an adult, right? Yeah. Because you already have responsibilities. You already have some prior knowledge that you're connecting the new things you're learning to. And so in one sense, it's not ideal for elementary school <laughs> yeah. uh, online format, but it, it, it can work pretty well for adults yeah. like who are trying to blend this new knowledge into things they already know. Yeah. I mean, I didn't talk about my background, but I did a traditional undergraduate degree, but my master's degree that I did took about two years from 2005 to 2007 was the remote learning online. It was, they send you a bunch of CDs that you had to listen or watch at that time. Oh, wow. <laughs> Instead of watching. CDs. <laughs> Just dated yourself, man. Yeah. I know. Yeah. She should <laughs> They weren't, they, I don't even, I don't even think, maybe they were DVDs. I don't know. Sure they weren't like the black floppy? <laughs> it was probably VCR. I don't know. <laughs> Betamax. <laughs> VCR. But, you know, you watch these pre-recorded videos on your laptop and then submit homework assignments. And so, and that was 15 years ago. So it seems like it's a reasonable solution for us to offer people. So all that said, I mean, both those, those two big gaps or those big things that we've noticed, the changing client or the evolving client and the time flexibility has been a big influence, CJ, on kind of where you're taking the curriculum. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, what's coming next? Yeah. So those two are a huge thing. A third piece of it, too, is we live in a time we see the proliferation of adult learning. Mm -hmm. You know, we see the proliferation of remote delivered remote learning. And this was started well before COVID. Like this is although that's obviously accelerated that process. And so kind of where I've seen it, where we've been getting the feedback and implementing it is how are the best doing it mm. in, in different domains? Mm -hmm. like taking and experimenting what are masters you know programs delivering in remote learning right now mm -hmm. what are you know clinical workshops who are submitting online courses like precision nutrition who offer online all these different programs trying to take okay what is it that they're doing that would work for our people 
you know, the kind of people who are excited about barbells or maybe starting that garage gym and leaving the rest. Mm -hmm. So that's been kind of the guiding process, like take best practices. The second piece of it that has really driven the curriculum design has been, what are we not answering well? Mm. You know, biomechanics was a struggle for so many students. Mm -hmm. We get questions where an older take might be, all right, everyone's going to pretty much start here. What do you do with them from there? Mm. And as we realize how so many people come in and they're like, I can't start there. Right. Or I don't want to start there. Right. And that's okay. Like, what are their options? So expanding the curriculum to be more client centered while still being delivering strength delivering the result that people expect, mm -hmm. I'd say would be the first major curriculum change. Dialing it down into where an adult learn is going to take it. You know, one of our biggest lessons from people's feedback was, do people really need, you know, to have completed calculus two in college to get biomechanics for the lifter? No. Mm. So bringing it down to not dumbing it down, but making it practical. Right. If it's not immediately practical for them to get in there and get that parallel process, it stalls them from getting that engagement in the gym today. So making it more immediately practical and then kind of separating out to where the adult learner can pick and choose. The adult learner can go in and say, OK, like once I've gone through the curriculum, I can go back to these reference materials. Mm -hmm. I can go back to this piece. I can go back to this or later on, you know, you can look at a master's class. You can look at, you know, deeper materials. But right. now that I've got that grounded education, like really been focusing on tweaking what that means to have a grounded basic education as a barbell coach. Then what do you want? You know, what's your next? What's important for you? Maybe it's not biomechanics. Maybe it's business. You know, maybe it's actually reaching out as a coach. Mm. You know, maybe it's your communication style. So, and realizing that all oh, that's really good. What's the base level? And then giving people that opportunity to push on as they need. So that base level is going to be what we're calling the Barbell Principles. Yep. The Curriculum. Barbell Academy Barbell. Principles course. Principles course. Very cool. So that will be an online learning, self-paced, access indefinitely curriculum that people can sign up and get to. And then what you're describing is more of like a different advanced tracks that they'd be able to sign up for that's separate and independent. Eventually. And right now we have the master's classes. Becca, mm -hmm. a, a lot of this realization, a lot of this growth and spread into the online space came from your experience with the anatomy masterclass. And reaching to people who couldn't make it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a, another key component, right? Like our culture, even with our coaching staff mm -hmm. is incredibly varied, like as far as background, right? Like we have some folks that have mm -hmm. never had a career except for coaching. Like they're younger and they've just started out coaching and they're brilliant. They're awesome coaches. We have other coaches like Carl shoot who has like a million degrees in like rocket engineering and a bunch of other stuff. Sully was a mm -hmm. ER doc. He still is a doc, but I mean, there's a million different backgrounds of our coaches and we see that as a giant asset. And I think we're trying to have the Academy be able to build on our students and, you know, take into account all of their varied backgrounds as well. Right. Whether you're a student who just came out of a exercise kinesiology program and you're like, you know what? I still don't feel comfortable coaching the deadlift. That's weird. You know, like I should be able to do that. So you want to you want to learn how to do that more practically, or, you know, you are an engineer and you're like, I need to get better at the actual practical dealing with people side of things. Right. I know the biomechanics stuff, you know, right. there's, I mean, people have different backgrounds. And so maybe anatomy, there's people who have never taken anatomy before. Right. And so when you start talking biomechanics, you have to have a little bit of anatomy knowledge to even think about it on that level at all. So trying to provide the opportunities to learn in those areas where different people with different backgrounds can grow, I think is another big piece. And at different rates. That's, that's right. what's really cool too. Like if somebody's a, you know, rock star at anatomy, they can, they can blow through that. And then mm -hmm. if they get bogged down on biomechanics, spend more time there. And, mm -hmm. um, or if they're really into the programming side of it, that's, I think one of the things that's really powerful about this new model. That's what we always struggled with in the cohort. You know, you have six months and you kind of got to keep up with mm -hmm. the clock right. and your coach or your teacher would provide so much like help 
like, you know, offering, you know, extra videos and extra time Mm -hmm. in between to kind of guide and help catch up. But there's no really better solution than allowing the lifter to slow down to, you know, to take their pace, to absorb it. Right. Right. Awesome. So when can people expect to see this rolling out? How do they find out more? Well, if you want to learn more on the site at coaching development and then the Barbell Academy, there will be a announcement wait list popped up right now. Uh, should be by the time this podcast releases. And mm-hmm. actually, I think by the time this podcast releases, it will be out. There will be an early bird offer. So if you get in now, it'll release in January. Okay. So you'll have full access to the course when it's released in January, but you'll get that early bird discount from buying here in Black Friday. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. And in the meantime, if people are interested in learning more, you're also running a Facebook group. Yeah. So if you're interested in learning more, the Strength Coaches Learning Corner is our Facebook group. You can find that through the website, Coaching Development. Uh, that'll you know point you to us or just Strength Coaches Learning Corner. You are more than welcome to join in. It's not just for coaches. There is always that take that by learning how to do better as a coach, then we learn about ourselves as lifters. So, you know, I don't want anyone to be like, oh, I'm not a coach. You know, I can't do that. If you treat yourself as an experiment, Mm -hmm. as a black box, Mm -hmm. where you are your own coach and you have that mindset, then you're more than welcome. Join our community. Awesome. Sweet. Great. Well, Thank you guys both for joining me for this podcast. Sure thing. And thank you listeners again for joining us on another episode of the Barbell Logic podcast. Please send to your friends, like, share, subscribe, and we'll see you all again on the next episode. Bye. Bye.